Yeah, thank you, Eve, for the introduction, and um, thanks for the organizers for making things possible. I, I think this is a wonderful event every year, and I, I like to return every year again. So, um, can you hear me all right? Is, is that okay? Yes, all right. Um, the animal rights movement consists mainly of, of two components, theory and activism. I've come here as a theorist to level some criticism at animal rights theory. For theory, to my mind, underachieves significantly when it comes to actually bringing about a better world for non-human animals. Not only does it often fail to substantially facilitate the practical work of activists, it sometimes, albeit unwittingly, even has a hampering effect on the whole movement, with activists taking their cues from some unhelpful theoretical aspects, as well as internalizing them and identifying with them. It is exactly those unhelpful aspects of theory that I seek to address today. This presentation is called Bringing Animal Rights Theory Down to Earth, a call for a pragmatic and realistic turn. What's this supposed to mean? Well, to my mind, a considerable part of the current normative theoretical work on animals is far removed or even disconnected from the real world. This holds true for some of the ideas, concepts, and theoretical background assumptions that this work is based upon, and it also holds true for the fact that crucial aspects such as feasibility and implementation keep getting ignored. It is in these respects that theory needs to be brought down to earth, that is to say, closer to the real world and the here and now. Only then can we make sure that the theoretical work in the animal movement puts animals first and really is about and directed at making this world a better place for animals. In order to improve the chances of achieving this goal, a pragmatic and realistic turn in normative theorizing about animals is called for. This is my central thesis. Consequently, I will argue for adopting a more pragmatic approach. I don't use um, the term pragmatic in the sense of any specific epistemological or ethical position. Instead, I use it loosely in the wider sense of dealing with issues in a practical, task-oriented and problem-solving way, rather than strictly adhering to theoretical, conceptual and ideological premises, ideas or dogma. And I will argue for adopting a more realistic approach in the sense of basing reflection and theory construction on real life conditions rather than on idealizations and utopianism. I will illustrate the need for such a turn by addressing three fundamental issues. First, the exceptional status of the animal movement. Second, the division of the animal movement. And third, the motivational makeup of moral agents. As long as these fundamental aspects remain unaddressed, the discourse as a whole, including all debates about specific aspects, runs the risk of being ill-equipped to deal with the enormous challenge of bringing about a better world for animals. By addressing these issues, I attempt to outline what a pragmatic and realistic turn in normative theorizing about animals might look like. And I will argue that theory can look to and learn from activism and thus eventually help activists to better identify strategies and ways of action that really improve the lives of animals. However, there's one <clears throat> fundamental objection that might be put forward against the overall practical and pragmatic orientation of my proposal. So I need to address it briefly beforehand. It might be argued that normative theorizing is first and foremost concerned with developing and grounding consistent theoretical conceptions and standpoints rather than with their practical implementation or their real life effects. There is probably little I can say to this view of the role of normative theory, except of course that I find it rather troublesome given the urgency of the matter at hand and the fact that it is often claimed that normative theory is ultimately geared towards providing guidance for action in the real world. But how can theory claim to be action guiding if it edits out questions of implementation and feasibility? Then, however, it would seem that normative theory is to be understood merely as a self-serving 
activity or as a means to further academic careers or stabilize it, its adherents' identities and self-esteem. Now for the first issue, the exceptional status of the animal movement. Within the animal rights movement, there's a very strong tendency to stress its similarities with other social justice movements, such as the movements for race, class, and gender equality, and to adopt concepts, terminology, and strategies from them. And indeed, there are striking structural parallels between speciesism and various forms of <clears throat> intra-human discrimination. So adopting established terminology and concepts, such as exploitation or liberation, may well be justified, if not always for on philosophical grounds, but certainly for strategic reasons. And of course, it is important to also stress the fact that the animal cause is a direct moral and political issue. That is to say that animals deserve consideration in their own right, and not merely with reference to human interests. But some theorists demand that advocates focus exclusively on the direct moral and political nature of the animal cause, rejecting any reference to prudential or indirect moral aspects which might have similar practical implications. From a pragmatic and realistic perspective, however, such a call is deeply problematic, for it apparently ignores the fact that the animal movement differs from other social movements in at least three crucial respects. First, animals can't speak out or act for themselves, but need humans to do so for them, making it one of the few truly altruistic movements, but also burdening it with a lack of original voices and actions. Second, there is no widespread consensus concerning the moral state of, uh, status of animals, quite contrary to many human-related issues of social justice. And third, almost all humans are directly or indirectly involved in perpetuating the system of animal abuse as they all stand to benefit from it in one sense or another. The latter two points imply that there is no powerful majority outside the system from which to seek support for change and transformation. These differences tend to get overlooked, although they have serious implications for practical considerations and call for a different strategic alignment. Acknowledging those facts, however, Animal advocates can't be choosers, but need to mobilize support from a far broader range than those advocating human-centered social justice issues, especially the insistence on promoting improvements for animals exclusively on direct moral grounds is ill-guided for several reasons. For a start, it overestimates the power of moral progress in general. Throughout history, the abolition of many obnoxious practices may perhaps be best understood as the confluence of a number of different factors, some of them moral, some of them economic or technological. In retrospect, though, people tend to view changes thus brought about as a clear sign of moral progress. While it may indeed be a sign of moral progress that people later do condemn certain practices and applaud their transformation, it is hardly accurate to assume that such changes were therefore necessarily affected by moral progress. But even if moral appeals sufficed, appealing only to those benefiting from and perpetuating the system in question certainly won't be enough, but some external support would be needed. Neither the abolition of slavery in the United States nor the end of apartheid in South Africa was achieved by an inside or outside minority reasoning and pleading with a majority of perpetrators. Instead, both of these transformations were only made possible by massive outside political, moral, and economic pressure. When it comes to animal rights, however, there is no outside power, let alone majority, to exert such pressure. And to cap it all, the animal movement even suffers from a lack of support from most of the various strands of the so-called progressive social reform camp, with most human-centered movements not exactly eager to subscribe to a social justice agenda wide enough to include animal rights, and with some even explicitly critical of the animals' movement for a multiplicity of reasons. Given this deplorable situation, reaching critical mass only by relying on moral arguments seems highly unlikely. 
Instead, a broad strategic perspective comprising even non-moral and human-centered aspects is called for to effect real change for animals. Many activists and NGOs set a good example in this respect, as they not only highlight the moral quality of the animal issue, and thus remaining true to the idea of and the rationale behind animal rights, but also draw attention to some of the other detrimental effects the established system of animal use and abuse has on other human beings, on one's health, and on the natural environment. And of course, reaching out to other social movements, as well as avoiding conflicts with their objectives, is indispensable to gaining more widespread support for the animal cause. In addition, the exceptional situation of the animal cause requires exceptional sensitivity in mediation and persuasion. That, that's a point I'll come back to later. Of course, such a broad strategic orientation would be considered unacceptable when it comes to human social justice issues. So campaigning against the exploitation of people in sweatshops by highlighting the potential hazards of these products for consumers would most certainly lead to an outcry from human rights groups. When it comes to animals, however, it is vital. And while such a broad strategic orientation can hardly be defended on a merely philosophical or ideological basis, it can be defended on pragmatic grounds. Some theorists from the far left or from the anarchistic camp raise a somewhat related further objection I can only deal with briefly here. They identify the whole political and economic system or the institution of the state as the main culprit and demand not to work within this system but to challenge it, to challenge it across the board. While I'm generally sympathetic to their analysis, as I'm also highly critical of many aspects of the political and economic system we're living in. There are at least three issues with this demand. First, it presupposes a rather simplistic and unduly unified picture of the so-called system, ignoring important differences and nuances. Categorical thinking of this kind entails the risk of viewing everyone else as the enemy and of triggering an antagonizing mechanism that will most likely result in an unwelcome backlash rather than in winning people over for the animal cause. If you want to change the world, you need to change the people. In order to change the people, we need, re we need to reach out to them rather than ignore or even antagonize them. This requires new and innovative forms of persuasion. Second, most other movements work within the system and still find it quite hard to reach their respective goals, although they can rely on a much wider basis of public support. If the animal movement also primarily tried to focus on abolishing the whole system, there would probably be even less hope that they might get hurt at all. And third, completely living outside the system is impossible, which raises the problem of consistency in terms of its rejection. Now let me be clear here, nothing speaks against working to transform and improve the deeply worrying aspects of the current political and economic system, but pragmatic reasons speak against making the animal issue conditional on the resolution of political and ideological issues, which are often based on oversimplified worldviews, and they speak against excluding anyone who doesn't share a specific worldview or ideology. Now for the second issue, the division of the animal movement. A major concern and subject of much theoretical debate today is the rough division of the animal rights movement into the abolition or liberation camp on the one side and the so-called welfare or regulation or reform camp on the other. However, this common distinction emphasized in particular by the former camp is neither accurate nor is it helpful. It is inaccurate in so far as it identifies the animal rights position exclusively with the abolitionist position and groups all non-abolitionist positions together, labeling them welfareist. In fact, there are other more differentiated positions that qualify for the category animal rights, even if they do not grant animals the right to freedom as such, but only the rights not to suffer and not to be killed. 
Though although such differentiated positions also focus on the well-being of animals, they draw very different conclusions compared to traditional welfareism. What unites all animal rights positions is the assum assumption of basic moral equality. Basic moral equality finds its expression either in the concept of rights or the concept of equal consideration. By contrast, the traditional animal welfare position, which appears to inform um, common sense morality and the law, relegates animals to an inferior moral realm and withholds rights from them. This, of course, implies a fundamental moral difference between humans and animals. Crucially, however, from a pragmatic perspective, insistence on this distinction is unhelpful as it precludes crucial strategic cooperation and diverts valuable resources to turf wars instead. More precisely, emphasizing this distinction is unhelpful as it seems to suggest absolute mutual exclusiveness of the abolitionist position and any non-abolitionist position, thus denying any point of contact. This is most regrettable because it exacerbates the extraordinarily challenging situation facing the animal movement outlined in the first point. The major conflicts between the abolitionist position and non-abolitionist positions concern both the goals and the methods of animal advocacy. The abolitionist position aims at the abolition of all animal use, or put differently, at the liberation of animals from human domination. For abolitionists, any form of use constitutes a form of abuse or exploitation, regardless of the subjective experiences on part of the animals affected. Because use always involves property status or hierarchical relations of domination. Instead, abolitionists put a premium on autonomy rather than well-being, and thus call for an end of all practices that violate the autonomy and liberty of animals. This implies terminating not only currently established and institutionalized forms of use, but also the practices of bringing domesticated animals into existence, as well as using or harming non-domesticated animals. By contrast, non-abolitionist animal rights positions don't necessarily require an end to all use of animals as long as their rights are not violated. So while a non-abolitionist animal rights approach might reject all currently institutionalized practices on the grounds that they involve suffering and killing, it does not imply a rejection of animal use as such. Instead, it leaves the door open for forms of use that are compatible with the rights of animals. By sharp contrast, the traditional animal welfare position does not question established forms of animal use, including the infliction of suffering and killing, in principle, but rejects only practices that involve cruelty and unnecessary suffering. Abolitionist and non-abolitionist positions also differ significantly in terms of strategy and how best to achieve transformation. Although almost all believe that change will take place in an incremental step-by-step -step fashion. Abolitionists reject any welfare reforms for at least two reasons. First, they consider them counterproductive because welfare reforms and improvements make animal exploitation appear morally palatable, thus solving people's consciences and encouraging the perpetuation of said practices. Second, they consider them unsuccessful because significant welfare improvements conflict with human interests. Instead, they tend to promote vegan education campaigns as the means of choice. Another strategic element abolitionists tend to reject is single issue campaigns, that is campaigns that focus on one specific animal issue, such as animals in circuses or hunting, or even more specifically, only exotic animals in circuses or only fox hunting. For they fear that single issue campaigns implicitly suggest a moral distinction among and a hierarchical ordering of different animal issues. And this runs the risk of conveying the impression that certain forms of animal use or abuse are better or worse than others. Instead, abolitionists favor a holistic or comprehensive approach directed at the liberation of all animals. Only some seem ready to support single issue campaigns on condition that they are explicitly linked with the general abolitionist message. By sharp contrast, most non-liberationist positions put a premium on exactly these strategic elements, 
welfare reforms and incremental improvements, as well as single-issue campaigns. For a lack of time, I will not dwell on this um, highly controversial debate, but confine myself to a few comments, both on the objectives and strate strategies from a pragmatic perspective. On the conceptual level, the abolitionist position and the traditional welfareist position are fundamentally incompatible. However, less emphasis on this sharp and questionable division between welfareists and abolitionists would facilitate acknowledging and um, more differentiated intermediate positions, which might help form new alliances and attract new people to the movement. That is, people who wish to subscribe neither to a traditional welfare, animal welfare agenda, which is morally unsatisfactory, nor to an ideologically impregnated liberation agenda, which is problematic both empirically and philosophically, as it centrally draws on a concept which doesn't apply to most animals, namely autonomy, and places it over their experiential well-being. On the strategic level, there are even further reaching points of contact. First, it has to be emphasized, though, that in order to assess the different strategies in terms of certain desirable and undesirable real-life effects, what is desperately needed is more hard-hitting, in-depth psychological and sociological research backed up by empirical data and less armchair philosophy and speculation based on and distorted by ideological background assumptions. And such an assessment of different strategies must, of course, also consider new and different forms of persuasion, not just rational argument. That's something I'll also come back to in a minute. So for the time being, however, we have to make do with further speculation. So here goes. Maybe the risk of reforms having a conscience-soothing rather than a sensitizing effect on people can never be fully ruled out, with the consequence of more animal suffering in the long run. Then again, throughout history, growing sensitivity for animal suffering and ever stricter regulation of animal use seem to have been mutually reinforcing, especially thanks to awareness campaigns and more exposure of the public to the plight of animals. This effect might even be amplified by some new strategies of persuasion and raising awareness. The abolitionist strategy, on the other hand, is fraught with the insurmountable problem of sacrificing present animals by denying them small, though immediate, welfare improvements that, might, that may well make a difference for those individuals for the long-term goal of total liberation, which does not actually benefit domesticated animals, but rather ensures that no such beings will exist in the future. While this may imply less suffering and killing in the long run, it is nevertheless achieved at the price of more suffering and killing in the short run. Setting aside all the uh, philosophical issues involved here, such strategic instrumentalizations, however, would run counter to the very core idea of abolitionism. So for the time being, a pragmatic solution to questions of strategy could consist in replacing emphasis on opposition and incompatibility by adopting a double perspective. This double perspective introduces time as a crucial element and distinguishes between present and future. Campaigning for single issues or even individual animals based on welfare aspects can be combined with raising awareness for the general issue of animal exploitation and with vegan education. This, this solution acknowledges the importance of both perspectives one reminds us of the long-term obje objective, the other of the fact that there are animals suffering presently. This more differentiated orientation is basically what characterizes the work of many activists and professionalized NGOs, combining various sorts of strategies with a clear animal rights message. Acknowledging the complexity of reality, they don't care too much about sophisticated philosophical categorizations oversimplify divisions and conceptual purity, but focus on the best results for animals now and in the future. And I think what Sharon Nunez just um, presented was a very good example of this. Now, to th for the third issue, the motivational makeup of moral agents. Within the mainstream of the animal rights discourse, the aspect of moral motivation 
that is the question of what leads moral agents to act or behave in a certain way is routinely given insufficient attention. When it is given attention, this happens with a widespread obsession for rationality and by neglecting or even rejecting emotions, probably with the, the laudable exceptions of the feminist and care ethics strands of theory. This is, to my mind, a, a lamentable fact insofar as it not only ignores the psychological makeup of moral agents, but also hampers animal rights advocacy. Despite the insights of people like um, David Hume or Arthur Schopenhauer, and more recently of social psychologists like Jonathan Haidt, many animal rights theorists still seem to conceive of moral agents as rational automata, that is, machines that need to be fed with abstract facts, figures, and data, and that then, by way of rational calculation, reach rational conclusions and act accordingly. Instead, much current research in the field in the fields of social and moral psychology now seems to suggest that our decisions and actions are often governed not by reason, but other factors such as intuitions, emotions, and sentiments. So reason doesn't seem to work as a reliable guide to insight and wisdom, nor does it guarantee action. Instead, it often comes into play afterwards to rationalize and justify our behaviors to others and ourselves. This is of particular relevance in the moral sphere. There are several reasons for this sustained commitment to rationality in the animal rights movement. Some hope to avoid the reproach of sentimentality and to obviate the risk that invoking emotions might be detrimental to the respectability of the topic. More importantly, though, many animal rights theorists are compelled to emphasize reason by the very concepts they employ. Autonomy, freedom, and equality are highly abstract and thus appeal to reason. Consequently, the rationalists foreground motives like respect for autonomy, or respect for intrinsic or inherent value, or respect for dignity. At the same time, however, this emphasis is accompanied by a rejection of altruistic effects such as compassion. The reason for this rejection is that, in their view, compassion is closely associated with the traditional animal welfare position and its focus on the rejection of cruelty and the reduction of suffering. In this vein, some theorists even accuse grassroots activists who foreground cruelty and the rescue of individual animals for the purpose of mediation, of promoting a welfarist agenda and thus counteracting the general ideas of animal rights and liberation. From a pragmatic perspective, this tendency to dramatically underestimate, willfully ignore or even reject the relevance of emotions in the context of moral motivation is, mo is most unfortunate for two reasons. First, it fails to recognize the fact that moral emotions may play an important part in terms of motivation of animal activists. Given a non-rationalistic model of human motivation, it is far from implausible to assume that it is often direct or indirect exposure to or witnessing of suffering and abuse of individual animals that triggers activist careers, and that abstract theoretical concepts and ideas are adopted and propagated only afterwards. This is not to say that concepts like equality, autonomy, etc. have no motivational effect at all. But at the very least, the strong initial moving force of emotions should not be underestimated and definitely not be rejected. Second, this has significant strategic implications for advocacy, especially for mediation and persuasion, which are of central importance for reaching critical mass. On condition that the non-rationalistic model of motivation is correct, employing only rational argument to persuade people of the idea of animal rights is doomed to fail. For this strategy may just trigger ever new and ever more sophisticated rationalizations of behaviors that are not based on rational or conscious decisions. Instead, appeals to emotions might be a way of bypassing this mechanism. And even in those cases where people do subscribe to the idea of animal rights on rational grounds, 
there is no guarantee that they will also act accordingly. Again, recourse to moral emotions may well prove helpful here, as they appear to play a critically important part in people's behavioral adherence or lack of adherence to their moral convictions. So acknowledging moral emotions can open up alternative and hopefully more effective ways of persuasion, which are long overdue to my mind. One such strategy could consist of relating narratives about the fates of individual animals, their lives, their misery, and possibly their rescue, as well as the personal experiences and stories of the activists involved. It is necessary to frame these stories in individual terms because it's the suffering of the individual that touches and moves us most. It is individuals that put flesh to facts and numbers, as, as we've just sadly witnessed with the, um, in, the, in the current migrant crisis in the Mediterranean, where the, the tragic death of a child has attracted more public attention than many months of abstract news coverage taken together. Since it is likely to trigger strong emotional responses, such a strategy is probably more effective in bringing about behavioral changes than stating abstract facts, figures, and statistics that appeal mainly to reason. Moreover, appealing to emotions offers a different means of persuasion that is less likely to, perceive, to be perceived as lecturing or patronizing, and therefore less likely to meet with strong resistance and defenses that attempts at moral instruction education tend to trigger. And if such an approach is supplemented with information about the general rationale behind the animal rights um, movement, maybe by portraying those individuals in question as representatives of all victims of the system of animal use and abuse, the reproach of promoting a narrow welfareist agenda is certainly unfounded. Again, NGOs are leading the way here. For example, the, the German branch of the um, organization Animal Equality makes use of such a strategy, and I think they're doing a very good job in this respect, telling stories of individual animals and their rescue. Of course, it does not follow that rational argumentation is to be abandoned. I'm, I'm making use of it here myself right now. And of course, there are excellent examples of how appeals to reason can be employed. For instance, to shed light on and raise awareness about the psychological and ideological mechanisms at work that are part of the problem in the first place. So, for example, Melanie Joy's concept of carnism has done a lot of good in this respect. What ought to be abandoned, though, is the exclusive focus on rational forms of persuasion. Instead, it is about time to also recognize and appreciate the relevance of emotions for furthering the cause of animal rights and to broaden the hitherto dim dominantly rational orientation of the discourse. Or to put it differently, it's about time for a hearts and minds approach. For this may be more in line with the true nature of moral agents, and it would be most welcome from a pragmatic perspective because emotions prove to be motivational assets in affecting real life change. All of this, however, is conditional on acknowledging a more realistic notion of moral agents. Now I would, like, I would briefly like to address um, questions of application. Um, intervention or protest, which are two different strategies of activism. I use these two because I, I gave this talk at a conference in Manchester and this was about intervention or protest. So what, what follows from all this for specific questions of application? such as the, the question of intervention or protest. From the pragmatic and realistic perspective and the problem-solving orientation I have argued for, intervention would seem to be legitimate to the extent that it furthers the objective of improving the situation of animals. And it should by now have become sufficiently clear that the proper point of reference and the central moral criterion here is the well-being of individual animals. Saving individual animals from horrific conditions by direct action certainly benefits the animals in question. And if this is accompanied by a mediation campaign that combines using the stories of these individuals with emphasizing their status as representatives of the billions of animals who live and die in miserable conditions, all animals stand to benefit in the long run. However, using violence, threats, or other strategies that will antagonize public opinion is counterproductive. 
Not only will it lead to the rejection of specific activities or groups, but crucially, it will also make it far easier for the public to discredit and reject the idea of animal rights across the board. And it is worth remembering here, for the reasons mentioned above, that the animal movement is particularly vulnerable to this well-known mechanism, with most people all too happy to be given a pretext to turn their backs on the subject. The same goes for the aspect of protest, which is generally easier to defend. Given the extraordinary situation of the animal issue, it might make sense to also join and support other campaigns so as to make use of synergy effects. For instance, it might make sense to join a rally against climate change, pointing out animal use as a contributing factor while simultaneously communicating <coughs> the idea of animal rights. So in order to answer the question of how best to save animals, we need to ask deeper questions. The most important of which may be, first, what are animals and what is in their interest? Second, what are moral agents and what motivates them? Third, what are the external conditions and challenges facing the animal movement? And fourth, what are the internal conditions? That is, what influence does theory have on animal activists, for example? Now let me conclude. If animal rights theorists really wish to contribute to improving the real-life situations of animals, they need to make sure they are down to earth and put animals first. To do so, I've called for a turn in normative theorizing about animals. From an obsession with conceptual loyalty, ideological purity, simplifications and idealizations, towards a more pragmatic and realistic orientation. And I have roughly sketched out how such a turn might look like by pointing at some of the issues afflicting the current discourse and thus hampering practical progress. And I've hinted at possible solutions. The most important means to this end, I believe, are a differentiated perspective and a critical mindset. A differentiated perspective reminds us of the fact that the world is way more complex than most theorists and ideologists would have us believe, and that the practical challenges it presents us with resist simplistic solutions. A critical mindset reminds us of the never-ending need for reflection and deliberation instead of dogmatic adherence to ideas, concepts and principles, and of the fact that we need to scrutinize even, or rather especially, the things we hold near and dear. To my mind, criticism starts at home. Only then can we reduce the risk of having blinders on and being misguided by prejudice, categorical thinking, self-interest or conformism. And it reminds us of the powerful psychological processes at play here, how our beliefs, convictions and our work as activists become part of our individual and collective identities and how defense mechanisms kick in massively as soon as any of that is being questioned. This is a crucial insight for both theorists and activists alike, for it gives us a taste of what we as animal advocates quite naturally expect of others. Yet how can we expect those we need to reach out to to subject their much-cherished beliefs and convictions, their carnistic ideology, if you will, to, crit to critical scrutiny when we categorically refuse to do so ourselves. So to conclude, a lack of both a differentiated perspective and a critical mindset is not only chiefly responsible for the lamentable situation for animals on this planet today, a lack of both will also significantly obstruct any attempts at changing that. To my mind, many activists are miles ahead in this respect, while most theorists certainly have some catching up to do. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I have one question um, on point three. Um, we, as a um, non-profit organization, tried to um, stimulate this emotional response um, by um, um, 
let's say, speak of the individual with a name, etc. Um, what we found ourselves struggling with is um, for people to um, go from this emotional um, state to actually um, starting to change the way they see um, their food or the way they consume. So, so we're struggling with this. Um, I mean, with this step. Can you? Do you have any advice on how to <laughs> improve that that step? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing this out. Well, I'm not a psychologist. I'm, I'm not qualified to to talk about the the mechanisms that are at play here. I, I was not suggesting to to completely forget all other forms of of persuasion. I, I, I was just worried about this this radical focus, exclusive focus on rational forms of persuasion. Um, I think um, there is no simple solution what kind of strategy is most um, successful. I think it depends on the situation. It depends on the individual people you talk to. There might be people who are more responsive to rational argument or to statistics. Others might be just very different. So um, I, I, don't, I don't have any answers to this, I'm afraid. Um, from my own experience, when I look back how I got in touch with the animal issue and, and how I got touched by it, it was by witnessing individual um, faces of animals, individual suffering. And only later on I, I tried to, to, to understand more, the more general ideas about this whole movement and everything. Um, and I still feel that, that emotions really have a very strong moving force. Right? That's part of the, of the word emotion. Right? It, it moves you to act. Right? And, and some theorists believe that emotions are the only things that really get people to act in the first place. If you only have the reasons, it's never enough. You need additional something additional to do that. Um, I think what we need, what we desperately need, and that's, a, that's, that's another call I would like to make here, is we definitely need more empirical research into this. Right? We've got lots of theorists making lots of claims about what is going to happen if we do this or that, but where's the evidence? We need, we need sociologists, we need psychologists, we need all of the bunch of these people going out there, doing research, asking people with questionnaires, with all the possibilities, and trying to figure out how do, how do you moral agents work? What, what gets them moving? What moves them? Um, and of course, you never get a guarantee that people really translate their, their convictions into actions. That's, an, that's a big problem, but I'm, I'm more hopeful, a little bit more hopeful uh, in terms of emotions doing this, this trick rather than pure reason. That's, I'm afraid that's all I can say to this, although it might not be satisfying. Uh, thank you. Um, I changed my mind because of my emotions, but also because I just uh, found out that uh, I didn't want to eat uh, horse or rabbit, and so uh, why do I, I would have to eat pig or chicken? So uh, I found the word uh, speciesism, and um, for me, it's um, I prefer to. I change uh, also how how I, I act for the animals, and uh, I realize that when we put a word on the discrimination, and you can uh, raise the awareness awareness uh, for the justice, and not uh, in, in, that doesn't implies the emotion. So, uh, what do you think of uh, this uh, non speciesist movement? Well, absolutely. Um. um I didn't try to imply that, that we need to give up these concepts. That, that's far from what I wanted to say. I just, I just wanted to kind of re rehabilitate emotions because they're just neglected in, in the whole discourse. Um, there might be people who are more responsive to questions of, of justice and, of course, pointing at forms of discrimination that, that have parallel structures with... with um, well-known forms of discrimination like racism, sexism, and, and so on, might, might be very effective with some people. There's no doubt about this, absolutely. Um, I wonder, however, I, I had a, a very different experience a couple of weeks ago. I spoke to someone, she was an anthropologist, and she, she was a professor, in fact, and um, she said that speciesism is, is a myth, right? that we, we cannot compare the, uh, this kind of discrimination with intra-human forms of discrimination. And she was an anthropologist, and, and she was a rather clever person, in fact. But she completely resisted this idea because she said, that that's something different. Those, those are just animals. Right? So this might also be one of the reactions that you, that you get when you, when you go with the, on the rational thing. 
again, I can only stress, I think there is no, there is no um, simple solution that works in all instances with all people. I think you need, you need to be a good activist. I think you need to be an extremely good psychologist. You need to understand how people react. You need to identify the right strategy for the right interlocutor you're talking to at the moment. And sometimes reason might be just the right thing, and sometimes it might get you nowhere. And sometimes a combination of both reason and emotion might, be, might do the trick. Right? You talk about individuals, and I said, don't just talk about individuals. Try to combine this with the, the general message about what's going on. Right? That's just maybe one piglet that one NGO saved somewhere, but you can kind of put it into perspective. This is not just this one individual, it's, it's a representative of all the others. All right. But yeah, sure. I, I wouldn't rule out anything. From a pragmatic perspective, anything that helps making this world a better place for animals is good. I would like to say thank you for the really interesting talk. Uh, it's over here, down on the right side there. Oh. Um, all right, sorry. One thing I would like to add to this discussion that some, some research shown by Nick Cooney, for example, is that the initial reason for you to cut down on meat or entirely dismiss meat is that does not prove to be maybe the, the reason that you give up, like that you mention later on. So like our, our initial motivation might be climber or something else. But then once you have that emotional barrier, defense barrier down, you might add and supplement your own arguments and your identity as a vegan or vegetarian with other arguments. So whichever the initial barrier, uh, we can supplement that with different reasons. I would like to add that. And then, uh, which you don't come into so much in this talk, maybe it's not the subject so much, but other barriers like price and availability of vegan goods and other sort of these obstacles that hinder like the more pra practical aspects of uh, reducing meat. If you have any, like, yeah, thoughts on those two. Absolutely. Um, I think I, I tried to address this at the beginning when I, when I said that animal activists can't be choosers, right? So whatever gets people to do or change their behavior in a way that it results in less suffering for animals and less animals being killed is, is as you said, is, is one first step in the right direction. Maybe get some, some barriers down. Of course, people have a very strong tendency, I think we all know this, to rationalize, right? So we, we provide reasons afterwards. This was not the original reason why I did it, but later on, I, I need to explain my, my, my behavior. And later on, I find reasons and explain it by, by reference to these reasons. So I'm completely with you. I, I second what you said. Um, get them to, to reduce... Um, or cut as, as much as possible from, from their diet by whatever means is possible. And, and some people are not responsive to animal rights, but maybe they're concerned about the environment. Maybe they are concerned about future generations, their own children growing up in a, in a, in a, in a world of, of uh, environmental degradation and pollution, or whatever it is, if, if you can appeal to them. I think once this threshold has been over... Uh, um, um, has, has been... Um, well, crossed... Um, it might be easier to to get this message across. Right? So that that is that is basically what I I feel. And maybe as you said, to to get the the first barrier down, whatever it takes. And I try to argue against those people who, for I don't know, ideological purity, argue no, you must not refer to the climate change thing. You must not refer to the fact that it might. Ha be a social justice issue with regard to other people. You must focus on the political and moral aspect of this, of this issue. Otherwise, you betray the movement or you betray the, the, the whole thing, and people don't understand. But this presupposes, of course, that the, the, the people we want to reach out to, they are perfect moral automata. Right? So when you present them with a moral problem, they understand this and they change their behavior, but this is not the case. Look at the, world, at the state of the world at the moment. If that were the case, um, we could solve all these problems just like that. Telling people, listen, this is a moral problem. You shouldn't be doing this. Oh, right. Okay, thanks for reminding me. I'll stop. <laughs> I don't see this happening. So let's try anything that works with, with whoever it is. Right. So I'm, I'm completely with you. And, and I think not many theorists take this position because they say, no, it's a moral thing and we should focus on the moral aspect. All the other things don't count. Right? Just takes the attention of the, of the real issue. I don't, I don't think so. It might sensitize people, get down the first barriers, and then who knows what's possible. Yeah, but thank you for, 
for adding this. More questions? Oh, in the front. How do you exactly um, differentiate between protest and intervention? And could you elaborate on that? Yeah, this was, well, intervention not in the sense of intervening in nature, but intervention as a means of, of, of um, social reform strategy, right? So kind of, I don't know, of direct action, for example, you go somewhere when you see animals being mistreated and you intervene actively. Right? The trouble with this is, of course, it all depends on the, uh, on the public um, perspective of this, right? If the media coverage is bad, for example, right? If, if activists are depicted as terrorists and this kind of stuff, it is counterproductive. Right? There's no doubt about it because it will antagonize the, um, the public. And as long as, as, uh, as far as I can see, we rely on, to reach critical mass, we need to convince the majority of the people that that's a fact. So we need to avoid anything that antagonizes them, no matter whether, this is, whether we feel this is justified or not justified. It's a strategic means. Right. So some people say, I don't give a damn about what the public says because I know this is the right thing to do. But the question is, do animals benefit? And I doubt this because animals might not benefit from this. And I, quest and I would like to ask those people then, um, why are you doing this? If it doesn't help animals, maybe it only helps yourself or it helps your own self-conception or I don't know, whatever it is. But I think um, if we are true, if we're really honest about the um, um, motivation for, for working for animals, I think we should put animals first and that our, not our own um, ideological interests or our self-esteem or what we, our self-conceptions as, I don't know, adherents of a certain kind of, of uh, ideology or group, right, so the identity. And that's also something which I find is very important. Animal activists are also human beings, right? And we are also flawed, of course, right? There are lots of psychological problems we are, we are facing ourselves. And I think that's why I called for, um, that's why I said criticism starts at home. We should also reflect on what we ourselves believe sometimes because I know lots of animal activists who, who adhere to dogma, who are the, the worst dogmatists I know. Right? This whole movement was a reform, is a reform movement, right? We, we challenge the dogma and then we, we just, congeal into another form of dogma? I don't know. Well, that's so successful. <laughs> At least that's my experience. Not everyone, of course. There are some of this, uh, and we all have tendencies to do that because we, we feel, um, yeah, we work for this and it's part of our identity. So if somebody questions that, we, we try to, to fight back. Right? It's, it's a defense mechanism. It's, it's only human, I think. Yeah, but thank you for this question. I, I guess we have time for one more question. Yeah, sure. The first time somebody yeah. having an argument about who is asking a question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, thanks for the talk. Um, I think um, it was the first point you tried to make um, that there are differences in, in between the, uh, uh, um, the movement from um, um, so social justice human movement and the and the animal mo movement right and you said something about that the that um um the outside um the outside force political and or um economic force um regarding the human um justice movements there um there was a outside force basically but but not um but not regarding the 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 animal liberation mo 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 movement, but I did not I did not quite get um, what the outsize force was. Right. Um, maybe I'm not. Maybe this is not correct in all respects. But I think for major transformations, it is true. Look at at the abolition of slavery, for example, in the United States. It was not made possible by just the southern states. Well. Slavery was was, was uh, commonplace. It was the outside, like the northern states and other other reform groups from outside that exerted pressure. Or look at apartheid in, in South Africa. It was not the white minority uh, minority that that ruled the country. 
which suddenly decided, no, we are going to stop this. There was lots of pressure from the outside, from the outside world, from other groups outside who were not the perpetrators, not the people benefiting from this. And this was the point I was trying to make. And this is very different in the animal rights movement because everyone is a perpetrator, in fact, apart from the few of us sitting here, probably, because we are aware of this. Um, and this, this makes it very different yeah, because we can't rely on, on this majority. So if, if you look at... I don't know, um, the discrimination of homosexuals in Russia going on at the moment, right? They're, they're, they're marching back to the Middle Ages, apparently, there, with all the legislation that they are passing at the moment. But there is outside pressure. The whole world is, is upset, right? People, I don't know, uh, celebrities, politicians, they voice their concern about this. There seems to be some uh, major consensus that this is wrong. It's the wrong direction, right? Because these people, because of their sexual orientation, they're just... They have the same rights and so on and so forth. And, and we, don't, we can't rely on this kind of, of mechanism when it comes to animal rights. But look out there. Go out there and ask the, ask the people. Right? They, 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 they clothe themselves in, in animals. They, they use them in any possible aspect of life. They benefit from this. They like this way of life. And they, are, they feel um, threatened as soon as, as you question this. So that's why I say we need a, a broad strategic alignment but we can't focus on the moral aspect alone because it's hopeless. We need to use whatever means is possible. And if people are um, receptive to climate change or environmental degradation or whatever it is, take this as, as an inroad, right? as the first step into that. Try to get them there. And then slowly, when they're sensitized for this kind of stuff, not just thinking about their own little lives, but, but probably having a broader horizon, then I, I'm, I'm optimistic or more optimistic that this might o also open the door for, for other issues. And you might also slip in the one or the other uh, information about animal rights and why there's a problem, because they are sentient beings and they don't like what's happening, uh, what's, what, what, is, what is being done to them. And that was the, um, the major difference, well, well, I think. I don't know if it's historically completely accurate. Maybe there might be other instances, but I can hardly, hardly imagine any, or I can't recall any, any instance where a major revolution or a thing happened because of a minority got a sudden insight, a sudden moment of epiphany, and then changed. It was always outside pressure and, and, and these kinds of things. But maybe a historian in the CN can correct me. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's no time left for more questions, but you'll probably be outside. I'll, I'll be now. available to discuss whatever you want to discuss. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.